Hello. In this video, I'm going to be talking about how to defeat a Mongol army. And to begin this, I'm going to provide a little bit of background on the Mongol Empire itself. So, in the late 12th century, Chinggis Khan began to draw together a confederation of groups from the Central Asian steppe region, creating the basis for what would become the Mongol Empire. And then, in the early years of the 13th century, his armies conquered much of northern China, much of Eurasia, and ultimately the Near East, and then west all the way to the borders of Western Christendom. Now the Mongols couldn't do this without being extremely adept in warfare. And they defeated many different types of opponents on many different types of battlefield. So how did they do that? And crucially, how in time did people learn to defeat them? Well, Mongol armies were formed predominantly on the basis of mounted archers. In the steppe region, nomadic peoples raised their children to shoot, ride and hunt. And these are all military skills. But there were various other things the Mongols had which made them even more capable. For a start, they had some very effective commanders who gained a great deal of experience as the Mongol Empire developed. And of course, the more the Mongols win battles, the more experienced, the more capable, the more confident their troops and commanders become. But these commanders were also very adept at using stratagems. And so, for example, in 1221, when the Mongols were invading the Khwarazmian Empire, as an empire centred in Persia, but also controlling various surrounding territories as well. The Mongols fought against a Khwarazmian army, and what they did is to create models of warriors. They then mounted on their spare horses to give the impression that the army was a great deal bigger than it actually was. It's stratagems like that, and they could prove very effective. Other advantages include the way the Mongols treated the peoples they conquered because often defeated armies were then enrolled into the Mongol army, swelling their ranks, but also enabling the Mongols to draw upon their expertise in any areas of strength that the Mongols could make use of themselves. And so one particularly good example of this is the Mongols' use of Chinese siege engineers. These engineers had expertise the Mongols needed, so the Mongols adapted and drew them into their armies when they conquered much of China. Another advantage may be the Mongols' sense of purpose and their strong sense of spiritual commitment to conducting wars of conquest. Now, the Mongol armies operated in the belief that they had been given a mandate from Tengri, the eternal sky, to control and conquer the entire planet. And it's in pursuit of that that the Mongols so rapidly expanded their empire. And so it has to be asked, did that sense of purpose, did that sense of spiritual commitment to global conquest add an extra cutting edge to the effectiveness of their armies? Other advantages may have occurred over time. And so as the Mongols conquered region after region, civilization after civilization, as I've mentioned, becoming more and more experienced, may that have had an equal effect on their future opponents as the simple futility of trying to fend off a Mongol invasion became more and more obvious, would that have therefore demoralised their opponents even before the Mongol army crossed the horizon? Another factor to bear in mind, and certainly we have many reports of the terror Mongol armies engendered moving far in advance of the Mongols' armies themselves, and that may too have had an effect in bringing about the Mongols' many victories in battle. Now, in fairness, there were some people who were able to defeat the Mongols in battle. A Khwarazmian ruler called Jalal al-Din did so in the 1220s, briefly, although a couple of years later his empire fell when the Mongols sent their next army in to try and conquer the western portion of his empire. In 1242, it seems as though an army belonging to the Latin 
Empire of Constantinople defeated the first Mongol invasion into their territory, but was then defeated by the second Mongol counteroffensive immediately afterwards. So battlefield victories against the Mongols were possible, but they tended not to last very long as the Mongols simply sent a new army against whoever had defied them. So then, how to defeat the Mongols? I think one of the most interesting dimensions to this is that the whole question of how a Mongol army might be beaten clearly consumed many people in the mid-13th century. And a particularly interesting example of that kind of conversation can be seen in the report written by a papal legate called John of Plano Carpini. And he was sent as an emissary to the Mongols. But during his travels, he clearly talked to a lot of people trying to find out how could the Mongols be defeated. Now, he learned a great deal and his report makes interesting reading. Two of his most concrete proposals were that the Mongols didn't like crossbows, so crossbows could be effective against their armies. He also suggested that the best way to defeat a Mongol army was to form an army against them on exactly the same lines. And the Mongols structured their army according to the decimal system. And according to this system, the Mongol army would have squadrons of 10 soldiers controlled by a commander of 10. And then 10 commanders of 10 controlled by a commander of 100. And then 10 commanders of 100 controlled by a commander of 1,000 and so on and so forth. Now, he could see the utility of that approach. And so his suggestion was that armies marching against the Mongols should adopt the same structure. He also included several sort of mythical or legendary reports of armies defeating Mongol armies that he seems to have picked up on his travels. Now, one of these stories was of a Mongol incursion into the far north, where, so the story goes, they encountered a society where the men in that society were born in the form of wolves. And when invaded, what these wolf men did was to cover themselves in dirt and then jump into an icy river. And then when they came out of the river, their ice and the dirt on their fur then froze to form an icy carapace. So when the Mongols shot their arrows at them, they were deflected by the wolves' icy armour. According to another story, the Mongols invaded one region where the mountains were formed from enormous lodestones, magnetic lodestones. So when the Mongols shot their arrows, the mountains attracted all their arrowheads and Mongol archery was rendered useless. Now, needless to say, these are travellers' tales. We shouldn't necessarily take them seriously. But nonetheless, they do perhaps suggest that people were thinking, how can the Mongol armies be defeated? Now, one of the most effective societies who proved very capable of defeating the Mongols was the Mamluk Empire in Egypt. Now, the Mamluks, they came to power in 1250. Formerly, they had been groups of enslaved warriors who had fought for the Sultan of Egypt against a range of different opponents. But then, during the Seventh Crusade, or in the direct aftermath of the Seventh Crusade, these Mamluk warriors murdered the ruling sultan and took power for themselves, forming the Mamluk Sultanate. Now, ten years later, when the Mongols advanced into Syria in 1260, they sent emissaries to the Mamluk Empire demanding their submission. And the Mamluks responded by killing the Mongols' envoys and therefore signalling that they were going to be offering resistance. And so the Mamluks formed their army and then marched out from Egypt across the Sinai Desert into the Levantine region, where they then encountered and defeated a Mongol army. And so that raises all sorts of questions. Most importantly, how were they able to do this? Now, part of the answer to this lies in the nature of the Mamluk Sultanate's forces. Now, I've mentioned that a large part of their army came from enslaved people, and these enslaved people were brought by merchants from the Black Sea region, where they were then sold 
in Egypt. Now, many of the people who were enslaved and brought to Egypt came from various Turkish groups around the periphery of the Black Sea region. And crucially, these Turkish groups fought in much the same way as the Mongols themselves. They were nomadic peoples, and so they were raised to shoot and ride and hunt from an early age, just as the Mongols had. And so at the very least, the Mamluks could face the Mongols on a reasonably equal playing field. The Mamluks also were very rich due to the enormous revenues enjoyed by the Nile Delta and the trade routes passing through it. And so they could afford to equip their forces very well. Events also played out in their favour because whilst the Mamluks probably couldn't raise an army much larger than about 12 to 15,000 troops, the Mongol army in Syria in 1260, or at the beginning of 1260, was around 100,000 strong. But crucially, much of that army withdrew to the east. We're not quite sure why. One possible reason is that the great Khan in Mongolia died, as the Mongol commander of that army withdrew to the east, so that he could have influence in the succession of the next great Khan. Either way, the Mamluks advanced into the Levantine region to meet only a Mongol garrison rather than the full Mongol army, but they were able to then defeat that garrison. Now, much of the explanation for the defeat of that Mongol army at a battle called Ein Jalut revolves in the actual sort of the cut and thrust of that encounter. One crucial um, point being that one contingent allied to the Mongols switched sides at one point in the battle, but also the fact the Mamluks had many of the military advantages that the Mongols had themselves. Another factor may have been the fact the Mamluks knew perfectly well that if they lost that battle, there's no second line of defence. They have to win that battle, otherwise the Mongols are simply going to take their territory and that's that. So there may have been a sort of back-against-the-wall quality to their resistance against the Mongols when they fought them at Ein Jalut. In later years, the Mongols invaded the Mamluk Empire on other occasions, and perhaps the most significant of these was the Mongol invasion of 1280 to 1281, where again the Mamluks won a major victory over the Mongols at the Battle of Homs, and again much depended on the Mamluks' ability to meet the Mongols at least soldier for soldier on reasonably equal terms, although a very well-timed charge seems to have won that particular battle for the Mamluks. But there are wider factors here too, because the Mamluks didn't try to defeat the Mongols solely in battle. They also tried to inhibit their campaigning. Let me explain what I mean. Mongol armies, because they depended on huge herds of animals, especially horses, but also animals for food, they could only really move effectively where there was good grazing. Now, the Near East does have some good grazing, and so that was theoretically possible. But it's interesting, the Mamluks actually recruited groups of soldiers whose job was to burn pasture land. So they're specifically trying to make their region inhospitable to Mongol armies. And it's notable that in 1299, when the Mongols won their first major victory, over the Mamluks and conquered Damascus in Syria soon afterwards. The Mongols couldn't hold on to Damascus and one of the various reasons given for their inability to hold on to Damascus, this is a reason offered by the Knights Templar or one of the a writer associated with the Knights Templar, is that the Mongols simply couldn't find adequate grazing for their army and its horses and other animals. It's also notable on other frontiers rulers tried to combat nomadic peoples in similar ways. So we hear about the Byzantine Empire, for example, actually rulers going to the trouble of planting trees in grassland so as to deny nomadic peoples the ability to graze their flocks and herds in that area. It might also be an explanation for why the Mongols weren't able to successfully invade either Western Christendom or areas of Southeast Asia because deciduous forest or thick jungle simply isn't suited to their nomadic way of life and their need to maintain very large herds and flocks to maintain their society and their peoples. So these go some way to explaining then how the Mongols were at least stopped 
in their various wars of expansion. So I do hope you found this talk interesting. Please do look at the other talks in this collection.